Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. Today on The Cognitive Crucible, we have two guests. First is Mr. Matt Armstrong, who is a former governor of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, now called the U.S. Agency for Global Media, and a former executive director of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. Also joining us is Dr. Chris Paul, who is a senior social scientist at the RAND Corporation and professor at the Party RAND Graduate School. We also have 15 other IPA members joining us on today's podcast, and uh, we look forward to a fantastic dialogue with our two panelists and the rest of the IPA community. So, Matt Armstrong and Chris Paul, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so both Chris and Matt were also previous guests on the Cognitive Crucible, and we will be sure to have links to their episodes in the show notes when this episode comes out. So um, the conversation that I'd like to have with you guys today will cover your recent article entitled, The Irony of Misinformation. USIA Myths Block Enduring Solutions. And of course, we will have a link to this in the show notes as well. So Chris, perhaps we can start with you. This article is fundamentally about US foreign policy and US engagement in the world. Why did you guys write this article? So it comes back to Phoenix Challenge 1 last year, I guess that was February, sometime in the winter in, in Maryland. And towards the end of the conference, during one of the sessions, someone stood up and asked a question or made a statement about how we really needed a, an organization to 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 take this to wear this mantle to carry this mission forward in the U.S. government, and we need to bring back USIA. And there was there was cheering and applause, and and I was sitting in the back and I thought, hmm, yeah, I've 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 heard this story before, and I know there are a lot of good reasons that that isn't exactly the right answer, but the underlying drive the desire to have some kind of belly button in the US government for coordinating and integrating and carrying out these missions is there. And so I reached out to Matt because I knew he knew all of the history. I said, hey, let's let's write a piece about bring back USIA or not and what we what lessons history has to tell us about how we might satisfy this need. Mm, right. And so, you know, Matt, um over to you, but it, it occurs to me that some in our audience may be unfamiliar with the United States Information Agency, and we've already referred to it as USIA. Could you maybe give a 101 on what USIA was and how it relates to this conversation? Sure. So USIA existed from 1953 to 1999. So it's just by the length of time that it existed, it's in popular culture and memory. And when it was uh, shuttered in 1999 and its pieces distributed generally to the State Department and then to uh, uh, something called the Broadcasting Board of Governors as an independent agency, though that thing was created five years prior People thought, hey, we just got rid of our information function. And then, of course, two years later was 9-11, and now we're in an information war. Let's go back to that. Well, USIA was, um, uh, as we wrote in the article, uh, a smaller version of what it replaced. And it was a separate entity moved outside of the policymaking process, moved outside of the um, uh, uh a lot of the interagency processes and it was a separate thing but it was a complete silo uh not as complete as the thing it, it replaced but here was this thing that people could tangibly think about so when the dime acronym appear, appeared emerged which is a concept based on um, an organizational construct we had an i information and that could point to usia we don't have a usia so therefore 
we have a missing letter in our uh, in our lineup. Mm-hmm. Did you mention did the did the USIA did it fall under the State Department? I did not mention it. Doesn't it did not? It was essentially a separate um, agency. In fact, these functions, as we talked about in that article, we talked about an agency called the International Information Administration, which was half of the State Department's budget and 40% of the State Department's personnel to, sh- to just give us indication of how large this was within our foreign ministry. Well, the Secretary of State under Eisenhower, John Foster Dulles, did not like this operational element and was eager to kick it out of the department. And uh, and ergo, we have this USIA agency. It, so it, it was separate, like the State Department and the Department of Defense and are 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 separate. It, it was a cabinet level position. It was not a cabinet level position. In fact, the arguments to make it a cabinet level position were there, and that's one of the reasons why they actually created this other entity because they said, "Well, this we should create this entity if we put it on at the table," and they never never did that. So you did have a USIA director that was uh, appointed, um, but that person was not subordinate to the Secretary of State. So um, USAID, USAID, for example, is subordinate to the State Department. It's it's an independent agency, but it basically rolls up under uh, state. USIA had a, a more distant relationship. Now, in the field, it did collaborate with posts in the field, particularly in the cultural relations area. But um, no, it was a, uh, a separate entity. Hmm, wow. Um, so in the title of your article, you guys refer to uh, myths uh, related to USIA. Um, what are some of these myths? As Matt mentioned, there was this, this, this magical recollection that people have of this organization that, that closed down where as part of the 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 eye and dime that we had that capability and then we didn't have it and the just the some of its availability heuristic you know what history you know so you know it existed but maybe you don't know that much about it or maybe you knew some of the the practitioners who got ended up in department of state and you talked to them and their public diplomacy skills were quite impressive some of the things on the ground that usia did some of the practitioners were very effective What's missing from the recollection is the complete divorce from the foreign policy apparatus, the complete lack of access to opportunities for senior influence. And so the the myth is, hey, we had an an, an organization that did this, where this is nebulous, this is information, this is assumed to include coordination with the broader foreign policy apparatus, but that's part of the myth. It didn't. And adding to that, part of the myth as it's invoked today, right at the Phoenix Challenge, I wasn't there, but there's the idea of countering the disinformation from an adversary. Well, that was an implicit benefit of USIA's activity. It was not charged with countering foreign propaganda directly, which is a reason that the Active Measures Working Group was stood up in the 80s. This was not USIA's mission. This is why there was something called the Freedom Academy that was discussed in the late 50s and 60s, because it wasn't, which was to um, identify uh, political warfare techniques waged uh, against the U.S. This is why Freedom Academy was existing. The USIA wasn't part of that conversation. Now, there were exceptions out on the margin that uh, that really proved the rule. There was an example in... Um, I always forget Honduras, I forget, um, where a USIA assistant director, associate director took command of a PSYOP battalion. That's not normal. That's just exceptions. As as Chris mentioned, there were field activities that were superior and fantastic. But as an organization, as a doctrine, as a coherent integration, that simply wasn't there. But the myth is there that it was this thing. Yeah, I, I think the myth is just a simplification. We need something. Everybody sees that. Oh, we had something, USIA. What we had must be what we need. But if you dig into what we had, it had some virtues, but it didn't have a lot of what we now need. Yeah, an interesting measurement, I think, is that within four years of the establishment of USIA, USIA, 
there are discussions on it needs to be reintegrated with state. There are serious systemic defects. And um, by 19, what was it? I think it was 1959, 1960, there's a report every year, every other year coming out saying USI needs to be substantially fixed. It needs a seat at the table. It needs to influence, not just inform. It needs to do this. It needs to do that. Or it needs to be reintegrated into state. And that was a constant drumbeat. And we forget about that. That's not part of the narrative. And then you have the coining of the term or the adoption of the term public diplomacy as part of a bureaucratic fight, which actually going to this issue leads us to today where we think about we don't know what public diplomacy is, which is in part by design, because public diplomacy as a term was coined to defend and describe an organization, not practices, not TTPs, not tactics, techniques, procedures, not outcomes. It was an organizational behavior rather than uh, operational methods. I see. So, uh, Matt, you mentioned this uh, a few moments ago, but the, the International Information Administration, or IIA, um, could could you describe this organization just a little bit more, may, maybe contrast it with USIA and uh, talk about how, you know, its uh, uh, charter uh, differed a little bit? Yeah, so... Um... The State Department was charged with this global engagement mission, and the it, that concept was far broader than the now. Exchanges were part of it, but technical exchanges, bureaucratic exchanges, agricultural experts, for example, census takers, aviation management experts, these were part of the exchanges to create um, uh, governmental, societal, political capacity in foreign countries, as well as educational fields, as well as various informational uh, programs like libraries, posters, speaker exchanges, any number of things. This is what time frame, Matt, you're, you're thinking? So this is starting in 19, the end of 1945. These things start happening. Okay, um, got it. Uh, these are institutionalized by the smith munn Act, which was uh, really one of the first legislative acts against Russian political warfare by the time it gets passed and signed into law in January 1948. But in the State Department, there is a, by 1949, the department starts to fight against this informational element. So when uh, Dean Acheson becomes Secretary of State, he creates this bubble within the State Department, the International Information Administration, to to provide one leader, one budget, one point of contact, but yet this thing is fully integrated into our foreign ministry. It is the chair of um, various interagency meetings. It is the representative for the State Department on State Department uh, international information policy, and it is uh, chairing uh, 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 um, what we would call principal committees or the, the like with other agencies. Um, it was big on private-public partnerships. It was engaging U.S. Uh, organizations within the U.S. to work outside. It was engaging foreign private enterprises. It was uh, working with the intelligence community to understand the environment better uh, and how it could, and it was it was uh, empowering what we would now call country teams because these reported up to this IAA administrator, this central point of contact, who worked very closely with the Secretary of State, which is an important point because the Secretary of State, Atchison, appreciated and supported these ideas. Well, just to sort of lead into what the next question might be is that mm -hmm. John Fuster Dulles didn't like any of these ideas. He's like, nope, this is busybody work. I don't like this. I don't want, this is not part of diplomacy. This distracts me from my diplomacy. And so this gets booted and some of the functions go out to USIA, some of them stay within state, um, some of them get dispersed to other entities. But this was a significant hub of, uh, and co of, of leadership and coordinating activity within the State Department. Therefore, it was also integrated with the field operations. You guys conclude your article with the assertion that this IIA model uh, provides some of the necessary authorities to conduct activities and coordinate across government agencies. Um, how, how is this something that is in, in needed today? Yeah, so, so although what we need isn't USIA, we need something. 
IAA provides a better example, but it, it, it just needs some, some consistent properties. It needs to have a clear mission. That mission probably should include countering foreign malign influence, but it also should include the, the execution and coordination of a, a wide range of information activities. Uh, it, it needs to have access to the foreign policy making apparatus and senior support. It, it needs a seat at the table. It needs to be part of the conversation. Uh, as, the, uh, as the famous Edward R. Murrow said, if you want me in on the crash landings, you need to have me in on the takeoffs uh, or something like that. It, it needs to be in on the takeoffs. And then it could be uh, an, an institutional and organizational home for all of the various information capabilities from, you out the, from, from throughout the United States government that aren't particularly well integrated where they are that exactly which ones, uh, exactly how, that's that's open for discussion. So there's lots of different ways to do that, but we like past analogies, which is why, hey, bring back USIA keeps getting set. So so we agree there's a need for something, but bring back IIA would be a, a better refrain. Mm, mm, okay. Um, I've got one question that I received from an IPA board member uh, a couple of days ago that I want to ask you guys to field and then we I think I have plenty of time to open it up for questions to the folks who are on the zoom call but the the question I got was many characters have been typed or inked or spilled about the impact of 50 year old 60 year old and even older legislation that is perceived as limiting the actions of our government in 2020 why don't we have legislation any time in the past 20 years addressing the importance of information and diplomacy as levers in achieving strategic goals? And I'll, I'll, I'll let either one of you take that on. I'll defer to Matt, because this is obviously a question about the smith munt Act, and he's he's written extensively and hosted conferences and, and, and has a, a very strong background in this. Right. And and there's a link in the show notes to Matt's previous ep episode where he talks at length about this. But uh, please, you know, Matt, what what is your most current uh, perspective on this kind of a question? So the the first just to spe specifically reference the smith Munt Act is that we forget that it was an enabling piece of legislation. It was to empower activities um, in a, on a global scale. Uh, it has been distorted and perverted because of people that sought to destroy and, and shutter USIA, Voice of America, Radio for Europe, and Radio Liberty. The That legislation was amended in 2013, which people seem to have forgotten about. And it, part of that was to an attempt to try to undo these, uh, these small issues of uh, converting it into this anti-propaganda legislation. But I think the, the, the real issue that you're asking about is really one that nobody cares. The reality is the interest on the Hill is minimal. So if I go back to, as, as the questioner framed it, if you go back 50 years, actually, I would go back to no later than the 70s, early 70s. So in the 60s, the 50s, and the post-war 40s, there were days of hearings of and they had deep discussions. Um, and these are just the hearings. And then you have the reports. And then you have the, the, the public writing about this, the front page articles about these topics. You have none of that today. You have very little attention on the Hill. So when I was a BBG governor and I would go to uh, a foreign affairs committee and I would meet with members to talk about BBG, how many times I heard VOA still operates. And this is from the oversight committee. So the 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 lack of serious attention from the hill the lack of serious attention from the executive branch combines to make this just terrible stew one of the lessons that i think should be taken from our article chris my article is our, our ultimate point is that it, it leadership matters the org chart is not going to create leadership. The org chart is not going to create a small S strategy or a big S strategy. The org chart is not going to solve our problems. We need substantial leadership. USIA is an example of failed leadership. Dola said this is not part of foreign policy. I'm going to kick it out. Atchison said it was. So 
you have no leadership, you have no interest, you have distraction on shiny baubles, you know, going to the armed services committee, or even I testified before the hard house foreign affairs committee over summer. And there's talk about DOD. There's not talk about the defects at state and how do we uh, look at the state department. So the, the difference between then and now is there is a serious lack of attention and lack of concern. All right. Well, uh, Matt and Chris, thanks for your perspective on all that. I, I think we've got plenty of time to have questions from the audience. Yeah, thank you, Chris and Matt, for uh, you know doing this uh, podcast. In full recognition that leadership is very important, uh, could either of you talk about what would the ideal org chart look like for an organization like this, or what are the one or two key capabilities or authorities an organization that we recreate uh, would have to have to be effective? And thank you very much. Yeah. So because leadership is so important, to some extent, the org chart doesn't necessarily matter. We talked about whether we wanted to advocate, oh, this should be a separate agency or organization, or oh, this should be a thing in Department of State or in some other department. And we decided we were agnostic about that. It's much more important that whoever leads it is embraced by senior most leadership and is welcome as as a subordinate to whoever they report to and they're included in the policy coordinating committees they're included in the foreign policy apparatus they're there on the 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 takeoffs and not just the crash landings that that whatever the org chart looks like the actual practice really does involve and integrate them and i think there are a number of different ways you could make that happen and I, I think it could be valid as a separate agency but it could also completely crash and burn as a separate entity and i think it could be valid as a piece of state department provided unlike the undersecretary for for public affairs and public diplomacy that it be filled most of the time and that it actually have a seat at the table uh, now in terms of uh so i'll pause there and see if, if matt has any further thoughts yeah, I, I would, uh, you know, agree violently with that. And I would simply add that trying to figure out what the organization should look like is putting the highway before the cart and the horse. You know, what do we want tomorrow to look like? And so often in these conversations, I hear, I want to do X, Y, and Z. Well, most of the time it's counter, it's anti, it's it's responding to the adversary's action rather than, okay, what do we want to do? What are the activities we need and then, okay, let's figure out how that fits in with how we need to counter and respond. It's always this reactionary setting, allowing the adversary to set the time, tempo, manner, method of engagement, right? So if we want to get out of this, this mental model of stop it, which is so much, which is how so much of our policy can be distilled down to simply those two words, make the enemy stop it. Well, we need to change that. And then we can figure out, okay, here's what we want to achieve. This is what the organization may look like. And you know, as Chris was saying, it's it's entirely possible. What we need to be mindful of is maybe the first thing we come up with, it needs to be flexible because otherwise the perfect is going to be our enemy. We we have to roll something out and then we need to be able to adapt. But that adaption is not going to happen if we don't have that senior most leadership providing that support banging heads when it's necessary, making sure that territorial fights don't impede the, the effectiveness. So this is where ultimately it's, it's what do the leaders want to achieve? And are they willing to back it up? And you know, back to the question earlier, for the past 20 years, actually more like 30, 40, 50 years, that leadership has been sporadic at best. Yeah, to, to echo what Matt just said and, and bring it back to your question, Brian, about what capabilities and authorities do we need? What are we trying to accomplish? If we have a, a capital S strategy that's clear, then it becomes easier to figure out hmm, what, what capabilities do we need to be able to do that? Oh, do we have the requisite funding and authorities to employ those capabilities? So, but how do we get there? Well, senior leadership has to care. Information professionals have to have a seat at the at the table. That requires some kind of organizational structure, some kind of eminence for this topic in the bureaucracy, in the policymaking apparatus. This is Kevin. I'll throw mine out, the, the last one. So just thinking about, I mean, the, your point about leadership is, is and strategy is important. I mean, there's been a lack of both really across administrations for, for many years. But if you were to have to 
assuming this were like whether we're talking about the, an undersecretary level position or an agency, you know, this is potentially a Senate confirmable type position. Like, what's the job description you would write for that person? Because I think that's, it, it's not just the personality of the person, but it's also the types of skills and the responsibilities that they bring to the table with them. And, and I think comparing what we might want from that type of person now versus what we would have wanted in 1999 or even back in the 1950s is very different. So just for us to think about, again, it kind of gets to this idea of information professionals. It's kind of an amorphous term, but really bringing it down to, you know, what are the sort of skill sets? What, what are the types of experiences that somebody like that ought to have if they're going to be effective? Well, my uh, my top would be um, the person needs to be aware of how foreign policy works. The person needs to be aware of how government works. Um, they need to be capable of uh, working with Congress just as much as working with the Secretary of State, the other Secretary with Secretaries, and uh, the President. Now, in my view, this person does not have to be already a close confidant of the President. For example, under Bush, we had a, quote, work wife as the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, and that had uh, limit, limited efficacy in, in the broader scheme of things. Um, and subsequently, we've had uh, uh, people that were very close to the secretary. So um, those would be the, 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 the top issues. I think they need to be aware of this informational paradigm uh, and uh, open to a big tent approach yeah I'll, I'll pick on that i know they have to be a true believer they have to believe in the power of information they have to believe that war is a contest of wills they have to believe that that we're operating on a continuum of of cooperation through competition through conflict and that information is one of the main levels levers in competition and, and they have to believe that we need a strategy that is proactive and and wants to accomplish something because they're going to be again and again in cabinet meetings or in senior policy meetings where they have to advocate for these positions. And if they don't buy into it themselves, if they're just parroting talking points prepared by, by true believers in their staff, then when, when contention happens, and it will, because not everyone is a true believer, they have to, to know when to double down and, and when to, to see that something isn't the core of their argument and know what's important about these sorts of things. Uh, so so they have to, I don't know, they have to come from this community, they have to have, have some kind of background or just be super smart and get it, uh, just get it intuitively and, and be well prepared, but they have to, they have, to have that buy-in. And then, yeah, they have to, as Matt mentioned, they have to understand how the government bureaucracy works in order to get things done, what they can direct and what they have to cajole. They have to be diplomatic so that they can work well with the, the other senior folks they're called upon to work with. And then they have to come to be embraced by the senior most leadership. And so how you write that in a job description, I don't know. I see Matt Ryan's got his hand raised. Matt, go for it. Hey, thanks. Um, how do you think about the, the human or the talent management? You, you're talking about true believers here at the executive level, um, but how do you think about the, the talent management of people who are gonna staff um, the people who are enabling those executives, especially in the context of, a, of an army or of a military where, you know, you need to get your KD position maneuver and, and a lot of these, um, the careers of people who are in this space are kind of after the fact, after they've, they've made a career in that main, um, that main area. How do you think about that? Yeah, I know. This is near and dear to my heart because I work a lot with the Department of Defense and I work with various defense information professionals and I, I see some amazing personnel and I see a lot of career pain uh, because of the military rotational culture and the need to check different boxes and assignments. I see Air Force now has a, an information operations officer, 14 Foxtrot. Every single 14 Foxtrot I've met, and it's probably up to, to 10 or 11 now, has just been an absolutely amazingly talented and really impressive individual. And that career field kind of tops out at major because there just aren't yet any lieutenant colonel or higher billets for that career field. So people who end up there 
hope that that changes maybe by the time they 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 get ready to get to that point, but but they choose it as a labor of love. Uh, on the army side, why don't we have psyop warrants? Why don't we let let folks who want to commit to this this area of expertise and become an influence professional remain in the field uh, without unnecessary rotation or rotations to positions that 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 make sense? Uh, why don't we have information operations or PSYOP general officers. I think we have one that happens to be, has some kind of PSYOP or, or uh, IO qualification, but that isn't, and it happens to be him, that isn't his main area of effort. He's, he's, he got promoted for other reasons. Uh, so, so things like that, where are the career fields, where are the op opportunities? Why, why in many of the services can't you directly choose uh, one of these information related uh, branches or specialties or or MOSs straight on ascension, either straight out of the academy or or when you enlist. Uh, it's it's often their their lateral moves. And sometimes that makes sense because people have to get a certain amount of experience with the military, but there there there's strong arguments to be made that there should be serious information forces in each of the services with some kind of core of shared understanding of various information related capabilities and and then movement into a specialty whether that's cyber or electronic warfare or military information support operations psyop uh, or or integration and the ability to stay in one or more of those and have a whole career there and develop it so that the those would make absolutely wonderful detailees to this this new notional organization that we're talking about mm. uh this is John Becknell just chiming in here. So uh, IPA tends to be a Department of Defense centric organization. Yeah, we, we are actively trying to, you know, open that aperture up. And this conversation certainly uh, is, is part of that. But um, would you say that everything that you just said, Chris, could have a, a version within the intelligence community and the Department of Homeland Security, Department of the Treasury, and th throughout the entire government uh, apparatus? I am not sure because I don't have sufficient familiarity with those agencies and their organization. Uh, all of the things that I was talking about, military information support operations, information operations, or whatever we're calling the integrating function, cyber, electronic warfare, these are these are currently unambiguously DOD missions and they have force structure for it. Uh, whether Homeland Security, you know, I know they've got CISA and they've got cyber stuff, but how they are thinking about the mission and the, the personnel requirements to, to meet that mission, I don't know. I have to learn more about what they need in order to figure out what, what they should be doing. But if it's part of their mission, they should have professional career tracks. And then Matt can maybe talk about uh, public diplomacy cone and how that's treated in State Department and downsides to that. That's really what I was asking is, uh, you know, not not copying and pasting military centric uh, capabilities into these other organizations, but having some kind of an information re related career track uh, in you know, th throughout the government. Well, I think that's a, an important point because this kind of gets to what Chris and I had written about, too, and that is this is everybody's job. And part of the inherent problem, implicit problem, if not explicit problem of creating a separate agency, if you don't do it the right way, is that this becomes the job of that agency, not my job. So the, 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 the information job role position is something that needs to be part and parcel of, of all of these agencies. But going back to the question to Chris and Chris's awesome answer, I... I would emphasize there's an expeditionary element here that needs to be, this goes into the rotational element, but this stuff is expeditionary, right? These informational campaigns, these issues are long-term and we need to, uh, there needs to be more attention to that. But I also want to throw out, Chris was talking about the, the MISO, the PSYOP and all that stuff, but the FAOs, the foreign area officers, the same idea. Um, for these act type of activities, the FAO brings tremendous value and also has a uh, career path that tops out way too low. And so I would also say the other way to look at this is that, for example, the combatant commander, 
is the JAG and the PAO at the combatant commander side? Probably. Is the PSYOPer at the side? Probably not. And so there is this process because the JAG may say, yeah, you can do this, low act, law of armed conflict, the war, while law of war can say, you can do this. The PAO is, and I'm stereotyping here, is going to say, this will, this is how it will play in the US. The PSYOPer is going to say, again, stereotyping, ideally, this is what you should do to get the effect you're attempting to achieve, which may not be putting a munition on a target. So um, that all goes into the, uh, the, the, what Chris was just talking about, I believe, in dealing with the career fields and the respect for the career fields. And then that ties into the State Department side, where you do have institutional cultures that are biased against the, the PD field. Um, you historically have a lack of representation and support by the head of the cone, which is the essentially the MOS on the grand scale at state. So the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy, which has been a position unoccupied by a person confirmed to that job, 44.9% of the days since the first incumbent in October 29, uh, 1999. If that position is vacant that long, where is the proponent? How effective can a proponent be for the, as they call it, at State Department, the cone? But on the on the other side, other element here is because there's been so little attention to this, there are so few foreign service officers. We've heard this often said lament of there are more military DOD lawyers and more DOD band members than foreign service officers. Well, that's FSOs in general. Now let's look at the information warriors, the PD cone people. And you have an even, even tinier segment and nobody cares. Nobody talks about this. Nobody raises this issue. And this has repercussions. There are events that I've spoken at where I've highlighted that there is one person from State Department. There was, in fact, a, uh, the Strategic Communications Capabilities Assessment a decade ago. I don't know. Or I was speaking, I don't know, two, three hundred people in the room. And I said, yeah, there's one person from the State Department, Lieutenant Colonel so-and-so. It just... The in a, when you have so few staff, your ability to participate in these conversations is limited, and you just have institutional barriers. Mike Taylor has had his hand in the air. Mike, can you unmute and go for it? Sure, thanks. And uh, and Matt, Chris, uh, thank you for uh, the article and your thought leadership. Uh, really insightful. Um, the timing, uh, given a lot of discussions ongoing, I just recently uh, left the State Department and the Global Engagement Center. Um, so I definitely have my own thoughts, but I wanted to hear yours uh, specifically about how would you adjust the current, call it information apparatus, uh, the IN DIME uh, within state, then also the interagency and then the NSC that would move us towards a more of a, I'll call it a whole of nation, not just government, but nation and whole of partner, international partner approach to ops and the IE. And this would span public, private, clandestine and covert. Let me just start with the comments that Chris and I made earlier, and that is leadership matters. So if we pretend that there is leadership support here, I would probably abolish the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs and recreate it just because the current position has so much baggage, um, but recreate a new undersecretary position and um, really imbue it with authorities and hold that position accountable because it is an undersecretary of state. It is potentially um, uh, a leadership position. Uh, it is potentially the chief international information operations officer of the government. It's embedded in the foreign ministry and it has connections to the geographic bureaus. It has connections to the posts. But I would also try to upsize the force that is the foreign service officers and the foreign um, um, foreign affairs officers, the civil service side. Um, and then I would look into what, if we revamp the undersecretary position, we revamp the global affairs section, which integrated the Bureau of Inter International Information Programs, which was the largest rump element of USIA when it was abolished, um, but since degraded. If we reconsider these things, because that was an operational entity, 
we recreate that, and then we have this capacity within the State Department that can provide other uh, 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 operational uh, pathways that then we can start to figure out, okay, where do we need within the IC, within the DOD, and we can start to develop and build an integrative function and a, and a um, uh, deconfliction function. So it all depends on leadership, but ideally we would start with an undersecretary position because it's inside the foreign ministry. Yeah, uh, more more prominence, more clarity of mission, and just more, more people, more resources, more money. Uh, but that that connection to leadership, that connection to the foreign policy apparatus. Uh, and, and again, I'm 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 with Matt. I, I it's not clear that that the current structure as it stands can get it done. That maybe with a a new name and a new undersecretariat, uh, you you'd be able to move in that right in that direction, or as a as a separate a separate piece of bureaucracy. But again, that's that's all contingent on on the prominence and access to to leadership in the foreign policy apparatus. Yeah, uh, just super quick. It, are there any other governments today which are doing this right or any other governments that we could take a page from uh, to try to emulate? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? You know, the grass is always greener, so it's easy to look other places and see something that seems to be looking good and not necessarily know whether that's a product of scale or something. So i or just familiarity bias. I know a little bit about, but not in depth about what they do in the UK and the way they have military strategic effects integrated in and and regularly meeting with folks from Whitehall and at a at a very prominent level. And that that's that seems to work pretty well from an integration and coordination standpoint. Uh, and I bet that if if we have a Brit on the line, they they would be happy to speak for five minutes about why I'm wrong and what's hard and and challenging still. And I'm sure there are challenges, but on its face, it looks like that's pretty good. And the total size of their government and military is fractional compared to us, so there may be some scaling issues. But at least at least on its face, the the level of coordination involved and the seniority the the, the seniority of the level at which it takes place seems good. Yeah, I would uh, echo Chris's comments that there really isn't a, a peer for us to look at. There are going to be allies and maybe adversaries where we can draw a lesson from, good or bad. Um, but we're unique. We have the, by scale, by complexity, um, by dynamic leadership, right? The rotation, the the issue of Congress, the issue of the, the White House. Um, so no, I, I don't think that there's, I, I think the better way to proceed would actually look back at our history. And this is where, whether it's IIA or what was up with Truman Psychological Strategy Board, which was sort of a, a NSC bit, why did that not work? Uh, the operations coordinating board under Eisenhower. Why did that not? Because if we're looking for the central thing, I, I think that's just as valuable as looking at a uh, modern uh, uh, government, other government. Yeah, I've, I've I've just thought of another possibly interesting comparison down and in into the Department of Defense at the at the the staff level. Uh, with how the Chinese organize their staff. So if we look at a, a standard command staff wire and block chart, uh, we have the, the commander, we have the chief of staff off to the side, then one layer down, we have all the G codes or the J codes, depending on, or the A codes, depending on what, what service we're in. But but above the, the Napoleonic sections, off to the side, we have, as Matt mentioned earlier, public affairs officer as the commander's spokesperson with a direct line of access to the commander. Now, if we look at the Chinese and we look at a Chinese military staff, it's it's surprisingly similar. They have they have the boss, then they have all their their different staff sections, and off to the side, where the PAO sits in a U.S. wire and block chart, they have a public works officer. Now, what's a public works officer? Well, it's one part commissar, 
which is not at all something that we need, but it's one part full spectrum information warfare officer. Now, what would change in how we thought about things if the position of PAO, instead of being just focused on the public affairs mission and being the commander spokesperson, was instead, in fact, a full spectrum information warfare officer able to advise the commander about all aspects of the inform, influence, and persuade and information warfare missions? I can hear the, the PAOs sharpening their pitchforks, but... Uh, yeah, you know, to, to to our audience, when this podcast comes out, um, I, I'd be really delighted for th these kinds of discussions to, you know, uh, instigate some productive dialogue on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, please chime in on social media. Oh, can I add one comment? Because I see in the chat, uh, Sean mentioned the Swedish Psychological Defense Agency. I think that's an interesting thing. Back in 2009, I hosted the uh, Director General, uh, uh, Def Ministry of Defense Sec uh, Director General, Mats Ekdal, who was then serving as the chief of this uh, this entity. And so I can share with you the report. It was a um, uh, conversation that uh, I had asked Jim Glassman to chair uh, moderate between Matt Zakdahl and some other folks. Um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, it is an example of there are elements in other governments, just like Chris said, with Chinese and the Swedish creation. Um, as I used to say in presentations, I like the Swedish model that got giggles, but there are things you can, you can look at that um, may not fit, but maybe there's a lesson that we can try to play with and tweak and customize to us. All right. One last question from Chris Dufour, and then we'll close it out. Hey, guys. Um, great hearing from you, as usual. Uh, always the the professionalism and the scholarship that you guys kind of bring to this conversation, I think, is 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 something that every one of us in the IPA community should be reading all the time um, and having conversations like this. So thanks again for uh for for coming on and talking to us about all this my big question kind of goes back to some of the answers that you provided earlier on on you know how do we how do we fix some of the institutions that we've got is there a better way to do stuff at state is there a better way that we can organize in the you know in the u.s military for for miso psyop whatever i feel like because those organizations have existing structures for force management or professional development as information people we tend to forget about the rest of the government or more importantly, the home front. Um, and I feel like now, which is you know where we started the conversation is what is different now than there was when there was a USIA back in the day, uh, this hyper complexity of information and, the, and who owns the pipes for that information. Uh, when we talk about American companies like Twitter or that kind of thing, where, there's, where that data resides, where it goes. So my question is, have y'all thought much about if we are to do something new, do we need to just rethink things from the ground up as a result of the fact that organizations like DOD or, or state are just not permitted to interact with or talk to folks within the homeland? And, I, and, and is that an authority that we should think about when we start rec making recommendations to whoever uh, for some new capability that might be USIA-like? Over. And, and that's certainly an interesting question. There's always a temptation, especially as an academic, to, to kind of, oh, I want to I want to do a blank slate. I want to do a zero based review. What if we didn't have all this institutional history and all these these existing organizations? Uh, tempting, but but cutting to the one of the things thing you said last about this tension between domestic and foreign operations, I think that's a space where we have to be very, very careful. So you, you may have heard, I, and in fact, I did it as, as part of a cognitive crucible. I talk about the Russian fire hose of falsehood and why deceptive based or deceptive based information can still be persuasive because of a number of, of human psychological foibles. And often when I'm giving that talk, people turn it from Russian propaganda to the behavior of, of domestic politicians. And I have to say, wait a minute. We can all agree that Russians lying to Americans is part of our political process, or is not part of our political process, but Americans lying to Americans is. And these are two separate and separable problems. And let's let's attack the agreed upon space. You know, let's let's attack foreign malign influence and the things that 
we all or we all should want as Americans as part of, of foreign policy and, and recognize that, okay, it's all the same information environment and cognitive security, we need to protect our citizens from foreign malign influence, but we need to respect their autonomy to believe and develop ideas that we may or may not agree with. And that where to draw those lines is a much harder conversation. So I think it'd be easier to focus using existing structures or adjacent structures on the, the foreign policy and foreign threat. Uh, not to diminish the the challenge of of domestic extremism and hyperpolarization and all of those other kinds of issues. But Matt may have a slightly different view. Well, uh, focusing on the foreign activities is certainly much easier. Um, we've sort of touched on that, but I want to speak to the point about um, state and defense can't engage domestically, and that's simply not correct. I think if you're talking about PSYOP Title 50, then that's something different. But um, last I check, I hear about DOD quite significantly in the U.S. sphere. Now, I'm not living in the U.S., but they're actively engaged in the in the U.S. And with Congress, there is a tremendous communication channel there. And the State Department, the same thing. Um, move aside smith Munt, which only deals with this certain stuff, State Department is actively engaged domestically, and it could be engaged much more. In fact, the position that we now know as the Undersecretary of Public Diplomacy was Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs created in December 1944, intentionally dual-hatted for domestic and foreign, and it was a highly integrated job. And this is part of what blew up when they created USIA, is that there was also this fragmentation and later the word public diplomacy, the term public diplomacy. But it was highly integrated because we needed to educate Americans. What the heck is our foreign policy? Why are we doing it? What's going on? And we've lost a lot about that. But I don't think DOD should be engaging the American public on this on a matter of principle. Um, the State Department probably shouldn't be the lead entity engaging domestically on this as a matter of capacity. If it's going to be engaging anywhere, it should be focusing its resources abroad. So then that leads to the question of, okay, well, who's going to do it? Well, that's a real complex thing. And I'm going to punch push that off a bit and just invoke the phrase, the best time to plant a tree is yesterday. And this is when we look back at the the 40s, even the 50s, the 60s, where we invested in education, we invested in, you know, new services was a very different thing. And so you had an empowerment of the people to that we simply don't do. And I don't know how you unravel where the the anti scientific this, this, this craziness of information and distrust that we have. Chris is a social scientist. Maybe he's got something on that one just to toss it over. But that's a much more complex thing. And we have to be really careful about all these things and how we frame and discuss and these things. Because, for example, the Disinformation Governance Board was a horribly rolled out enterprise, poorly named, terribly rolled out. No surprise. It just got shot down and attracted all the fire that it did. So any of these activities, we have to be thinking with informational hats on thinking, okay, how is this gonna be perceived? Because last I checked, we don't need to rely on black ops or even gray ops. This is supposed to be relying on the truth. So let's have something that is easily defensible. That doesn't mean that it's not going to be attacked. It doesn't mean people aren't going to lie about it. People aren't going to be confused. There's gonna be disinformation, but there's misinformation and lack of information. So ghost and, and also one thing we haven't mentioned at all here, but is is centered to this is risk aversion and the need. And this goes right into this leadership part that we have to be able to take risks and we need to enable that. And that's going to work for the domestic engagement as well, not just the foreign engagement. Chris Paul and Matt Armstrong. Uh, obviously, you guys have given us a lot to think about, and uh, thank you both for being return guests on The Cognitive Crucible. Thanks, John. Thank you. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, 
visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.